terrible confession to make. When I was young, I was indifferent to school. If I did not get mom and dad off my back, I would have it. My mother used to tell a story on me, and I think I was in the second or third or fourth grade. We had the math test, which we had to pay to stay when we were supposed to subtract. students have been learning. The words, in the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took a loaf of bed, bread and broke it and said, take and eat, this is my body given to you. First occurred chronologically in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Chronologically, that's followed by Mark, and then by Matthew, and then by Luke. <clears throat> so you can read the Gospel of John till, from now till the cows come home. I never really understood that. People used to say that all the time when I was a kid. But anyway, um, you can read it as much as you want to. You're never going to find other words in the Gospel of John because they aren't there. Today's word. Whoever does not eat of me and whoever does not drink of me, this is John's take on Holy Communion. This is where John says, this is what you have to do to fully be a Christian. You know, early in the first century AD, Christianity began to spread. People would hear this kind of text and they would say, these people are cannibals. Well, they weren't. But people thought they were. One of the reasons for the Christians persecuted. But we need to understand that there is something essential in who Jesus is. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a teacher, though he's both of those things. He is, we understand, the Son of God who freely this is important freely gives himself for us. There on the night when he was betrayed, there up in the uh, Garden of a mine's a terrible thing to do, but y'all don't get old. Uh, garden up on 
Mount. Gethsemane. Gosh. <laughs> you know, sometimes I turn my head and knowledge just dribbles out my ears, and I don't know if I can't find it sometimes when I want it. So when he's there, if he wanted to, he could have walked away and nobody would have been able to put a hand on him. We know this because in the Gospels, when he goes back to his home in Nazareth and preaches in the... I'm having a terrible day today. Synagogue. They reach out to grab him and throw him off the brow of the hill and he just walks away and they can't put their hands on him. He can say no. This is why he goes up and has that prayer. Father, this is going to hurt. I don't want to have to do it if I don't have to, but nevertheless, if it's what you need me to do, I'll do it. You know, sometimes we think that we get that nice little prayer and say, oh, Jesus is such a good fellow. But you know, he was trying to figure out, is there something else we can do? But regardless, your will, not mine. And that makes all the difference in the world for us. That's important that that happens in the garden. Because as we remember in the Bible, in the first couple of chapters, there's another garden. And Adam and Eve were there, and the serpent comes in and says, We've got a pretty nice place here. You get to use all this stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. What did you get to eat? We didn't eat of any of the, anything, you know. Here are all the different fruits and bushes and things like that. And he says, was well, there anywhere where you can't eat? He says, well, yeah, there's this one place that we can't eat. It's just the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And uh, God says, don't eat there. And the serpent says, but you know, that's good fruit, and it will make you be like God. And Adam and Eve, because although it says Eve reaches out and plucks, God, Adam doesn't say, don't touch that. The temptation to be like God overcomes their willingness to obey God. The whole creation is thrown out of the after that. And so now here is Jesus in another garden. coming and it's going to hurt a lot and he says whatever it is you want me to do God that is what I will do Jesus compares his body to bread blood and wine and says whoever eats of me will have life and whoever drinks of me will have life and if you do not then you will not have life. Now he's not saying that you're going to live forever that sometimes when you hold your hand the wrong way that somehow the nerves get all tingly you know that's one of the problems with age or as my doctor told me at the beginning of the month, I'm starting to get a little arthritis in my hand and that uh, I take some Tylenol to live with it. It's not going away. Jesus says, what you want, I will do. That understanding of his mission that understanding of who he is. Because he talks right here in the lesson, says, you can go and see where I came from. He's talking about heaven. You can go and see where I'm going back to heaven again. But I am here with you on this earth now, and I am going to give you my body, and I'm going to give you my blood. And this is going to be where you will find salvation. It's nowhere else. Meditation won't get it for you. You know, you can, you can make yourself at one with the world in your mind and it will not get you to salvation. 
doing good things won't get you there. You know, we, we always forget uh, that the one time we read the story about a ladder between heaven and earth, it's the ladder that's coming down, it's not going up. You know, it's the angels that are coming down the ladder to earth to do good work, not people that are climbing up to get into heaven. As good as we can be, and I believe in being good, I do. I think that one of the best things about being a Christian is the ability to do random acts of kindness. You know, where you just, you see somebody and you're like, how are you doing today? Are you looking good? Or you're in grocery, you know, you're walking out to your car in the grocery store and you see an older couple trying to get their groceries put away and you give them a hand and take them, put their car up for them, or any other little thing like that. Have somebody in the meal, just give them, put the garbage can up for them if they got it out on the road and they had trouble with it. Any little thing like that makes somebody life better. But it won't get you into heaven. It may make you feel like you're coming, but you've got that. But that really won't get you into heaven. But it's Jesus who's obedient. Willing to go into death for us. Let's not think about that. Jesus gets born as a human being, and so in that sense, humanity, being human, becomes a part of the life of God. Jesus goes to the cross and dies, and that too becomes a part of the life of God. Those are the two big things for us getting born in, in we all know, sometime a hundred years from now or something, we, we may die. But that's a part of the life of God because of Jesus. God understands what it's like to get born, to grow up, to go through life, and face the decisions that we have to make. To know what it's like to come to the end of life. What happens after that? Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't really know what happens after we die, but I am willing to trust Paul in Romans when he says there's nothing that separates us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, not even death. But whatever it is, whatever happens at death, God still loves us. God still holds us. In Jesus, we have life. So we have this day when school is starting again, and I know your kids are going, oh, God, school. It's the best time of your life. You just don't know it until you get to be about 40. And you say, I wish I was back in school again. If I knew then what I know now, I would do so much better. It's true. We all say that. But you always need to remember. God's love is there for you. Even in school. As much as you may hate it. God doesn't hate it. God gives it as a gift to you. God gives himself in Jesus for us.